fun ruining our economy, says Planet Money. The irony is I just got done listening to a podcast from Planet Money talking about uh, Liberty City, City, Texas, the Vaughn Army, which is right south, about 20 miles of San Antonio, where they have no property tax, uh, basically no municipal government whatsoever for the most part, um, even though it's, a, uh, it's an incorporated town. And it sounds awesome. Sounds awesome. It's funny because they're interviewing this guy, this college kid who had a you know graduate degree in freaking government management or something like that. And he interned down there and now he's all pissed off. He's like, oh, they didn't take on debt. You know, they're not raising taxes. If you look through the town, it doesn't look like a town. Yeah, that's not necessarily a bad thing, brother. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Just because it doesn't look like a town for you, you are maximizing freedom. And you're keeping people's money uh, well respected. So, anyway, if you get a chance, listen to that Planet Money podcast, Liberty City. And they, uh, it's, I always chuckle at these because there's always a bias implicit in all these NPR type of uh, podcasts. And the bias is always in favor of bigger, bigger government, without question, without fail. And the funny thing is, they're sitting there saying, oh, you're just raising revenues by speeding tickets to non-residents. And I'm like, yeah, well, name one freaking town that doesn't do that, man. It's freaking, you go through any town. <laughs> Never mind the state of New Jersey. You get busted there with a firearm, you're going to jail. Even though the same liberals in New Jersey say, we don't want to separate kids from their parents. Yeah, they put this black lady, single black lady, that fear for her life in Philadelphia, commuting to work in New Jersey, and they arrested her for keeping a freaking uh, a handgun in her car. And they literally sent her to jail for a couple of years until someone, I think it's Chris Christie, finally exonerated her or something like that. Anyway, it's just nuts. And I said, yeah, you didn't want to separate kids from their parents unless it's your team doing it. All right, so let's read this. This is an excerpt from Planet Money's newsletter. Again, Dateline is uh, the October 8, 2019. Greg Ro- Rosalski. Rosalski. In the mid-2000s, Michael Burry, you might remember him from the movie, uh, what was that movie called? The Big Short, smelled trouble in the housing market. Realizing that big banks were packaging shady subprime mortgages and reselling them as surefire investments. He concluded that would lead to a spectacular collapse. And he made a huge bet against the market and ultimately tons of money. Yeah, here it goes. His story was dramatized in the book The Big Short by Michael Lewis in a Hollywood movie, which he was played by Christian Bale. Uh, Burry recently told Bloomberg that he sees another massive bubble butt happening. This time, he says, it's an index funds. Oh, for the love of me. Instead of relying on financial experts to actively pick winners and losers, index funds buy everything in the market, passively going up and down as the entire market goes up and down. If you're saving for retirement, there's a good chance you're invested in at least one of them. In 1995, index funds represented only 4% of total assets invested in stock mutual funds. By 2014, that had jumped to 34%, and it's now over $4 trillion in assets in index funds. More than the market cap of Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, and Google combined. Index funds make a persuasive offer. Don't pursue the expensive and risky strategy of buying and selling individual stocks. Don't pay brokers or mutual fund big fees to move money around for you. Instead, just park your money in these asset money makers, which offer lower fees, diversified risk, and the data has made, has, data has made clear better returns over the long run. Actually, they don't say that. Uh, they don't, they don't uh, uh, make a persuasive offer that they're money makers, by the way. Um, they don't say that. Uh, they say, on average, index funds most likely will beat the market net of fees. Why? Because the market, <laughs> I've done this a million times on Sunday, the market, stock A, stock B, you take them together, you get a market of C. Stock A did better than C, stock B did worse than C, thus you get C. You take the fees that both stock A and stock B have, and most likely they'll be on the left side in terms of performance, lesser performance than C, because C is gross fees, A and B are net fees. And inherently because of that, the majority, actually the vast majority of active management will underperform the market because of the fees they charge. It really is not debatable, my friends. 
Uh, a lot of people say, but you're living in a vacuum. And I, I've heard that a, a couple times lately. You can't say the majority of funds underperform. That's, you're living in a vacuum or something like that. Or it's a fixed pie. That's what it was. It's, you're thinking it's a fixed pie. I, I, don't, I literally don't understand that argument against the fact that the markets will outperform the majority of funds. It's inherently obvious, my friends. It, <laughs> net of fees, the majority of funds cannot outperform the market on any consistent basis. It's just not going to happen. And we know this. We've seen it time. It's just, it's not, uh, it's not debatable. And I hate saying that. Like, climate scientists is a, a, not debatable anymore. It's silly. But in this case, it is. Majority of funds inherently cannot outperform the market net of fees. Again, fund A returns 8. Fund C returns 4. The market is 6. All right. If fund A charges 2%, and fund C and fund B charges 2%. Fund A is at 6. The market performance is still 6. <sighs> All right, let's keep going. Actively buying and selling stocks and bonds provide a service in the market. It's called price discovery. If something is overvalued, traders sell it. If it's undervalued, they buy it. That moves the price of the asset and is a crucial mechanism to make sure the price is right, signaling its true value. Now, this is where libertarians 100% would agree why socialism will never work, because you take, socialism takes away the price mechanism, the discovery of what something is worth. But here's the issue. There's no right or wrong price for anything. The price is only valued at what someone's willing to pay for it. That's it. So if someone's willing to pay for something, that's what the price is. There's no overvalue or undervalue. It's just, it's just not. If I'm willing to pay 500 bucks for this tree I'm passing by right now, and you're only willing to pay 300 bucks, well, I'm going to pay 500 bucks. That's the price for it because that's what I'm willing to pay. But index funds don't really discover prices. Investors just dump money into these investments, which mindlessly hold stock in companies whether they're doing well or not. <sighs> Silly. Do not know how the S&P 500 is run. It's actually an active managed index, by the way. Uh, they do eliminate some funds, some stocks. They add stocks, I think, four times a year they do that. Uh, so the S&P 500 is not truly a passive. We're just thrown in there. Either way, it doesn't take away the debate about this. Uh, the price mechanism is absolutely still there for sure. How do we know? Because people have to buy and sell in order to invest money into the market or to sell uh, to, to sell in order to get money out of the market. So activity is always forever going. When you want to buy that house and you sell your funds, there is a sell and there's going to be a price side on the other side of that, either through active management or for index funds. There's going to be a, someone on the other side of the trade. And so because of that, there is a price mechanism already baked into the, into the cake here, without question. Now, if there's no one on the other side of the trade, right, because it's all, I mean, it, so let's just say I have to sell 200000 bucks to buy my vacation home. And I say, okay, the index fund says, well, we don't buy or sell based on price. We just buy or sell. Well, you're still putting in $200,000, you and your other you know, employees at your company, you're still putting in $200,000 into the index fund. All right? So the Gus Souter, who used to run the Vanguard S&P 500 for many years, he goes out there and initiates a sell of 200000 bucks into the S&P 500. On the other side of the trade is someone buying it who's investing in the S&P 500, the new money going in. So Gus Souter is selling to get the 200000 out, and Gus Souter is buying to get the 200000 in. That's how it works. And he's not saying this is the price that's right or wrong. He's saying this is what the market price is today based on the activity of people doing this. There's just no other way around that. Now, I guess you could say if 100% of the market was dominated by index funds and there were no active sellers and buyers, what would that mean in terms of me trying to get my 200000 out and you trying to invest your 200000 in? What would we do to agree upon a price? I don't know. We've never had to deal with that. It'd be interesting to find out, but I guarantee it's going to be no different than what it is today where someone's got to be on the sell and someone's going to be the buy side. I mean, the idea that there's not going to be a market because the only time there's no price is when there's no market. If there's a buy side and a sell side, inherently there's a market. What will the price be determined by that market? Well, probably be if the, if the price is trading too low, like a bond. See, that's the thing. If you look at the bond market, there is no... To sell a bond, all right, you actually got to go out and there put bids out there. 
to bond traders. And you said, and this is where the active management of bonds and but also index funds insurance companies work. They say, look, I need to raise two hundred thousand dollars to buy my vacation home in Aspen, Colorado, whatever this costs. And so you put out there, you say, look, I have these bonds mature. Mature is two thousand twenty-five. Right now, the yield to maturity is 5%, whatever. What will people give me for these bonds? And you put it out there, and funds will say, we'll give you this, that, and the other. And then you get a price, you get a bid, you get an ask, and that's how you negotiate a price. I don't know why that'd be any different from an index perspective. If someone says, I need to sell $200,000 of my S&P 500 index. Someone else says, all right, I'll take that trade, but I'll give you 81 bucks a share. Someone else says, now I'll give you $80 a share. Well, as a seller, I'm going to take the $81 a share over the 80. I don't, I don't get why that'd be any different. You're still going to have people to actually buy and sell. They're just not buying and selling based on what they feel is undervalued or overvalued. And finally, let me also say too, real quick, well, let's just keep reading. Uh, index funds don't really discover prices. Investors just dump money into these investments, which mindlessly, we already talked about that. Well, they also sell mindlessly too, right? You see what I'm saying? So... The price mechanism there, if everyone's just buying, the price mechanism is there if there's a side on the sale. Uh, uh, there's got to be a buy side and a sell side to have a price mechanism. In, in 2008, because of mark-to-market accounting, we only had the sell side. There was no buy side because no one had the funds in which to buy anything. There was just no money there because of liquid, uh, liquidity uh, problems and leverage and whatnot. And then because of mark to market, they were forced, these corporations, to basically sell all their non-performing assets, like I've shared with you a million times on Sunday. So essentially what happened was everyone's trying to sell. There was no buyers out there. So no buyers means who's going to buy the uh, other side of the trade? Nobody's going to. And that's an active, that is an, an active market. There's no buyers out there. In fact, it's interesting. If you look at the, the book, uh, The Big Short, he had, this guy, Michael Burry, had to create his own market for the price and sale. He had to do that because there was no other side of the trade. So in 2008, there's no other side of the trade for these bonds, which is why they fell off a cliff and water, off, off a brick and water, because there's no buy side. There's only sell side. Well, and index funds, why would there not be a buy side or sell side when someone's trying to sell? They act as if there's only one side of the trade. That's, that's foolhardy. All right, let's keep going. So Burry says he believes the fall of active buying and selling has led to overvaluations. And he's predicting a crash in the value of the large companies held in index funds. I just don't know what the timeline will be. Like most bubbles, the longer it goes on, the worse the crash will be. He's now investing in small companies, which he says are often ignored by index funds. Really? Total stock market index ignores small companies. Uh, small cap index ignores small companies. That's just foolish. Barry, or Burry has not disclosed much about his data or methodology. And like any trader, he could be wrong. But even if he is, concerns about index funds go well beyond bubbles. Legal scholars Lucian Bebchuk and Scott Hurst recently published a working paper called The Specter of the Giant Three. And this is where I, I agree with this part right here. The vast majority of money flowing in index funds are flowing into three firms, Vanguard, BlackRock, and State Street Global Advisors. Their combined average stake in each of the top 500 American corporations has gone from 5.2% in 1998 to 20.5% in 2017. The market for index funds, uh, these guys argue, naturally favors bigness. Managing a trillion dollar fund is not dramatically more expensive than managing a billion dollar fund. This means that big firms can use their larger revenue stream to offer consumers lower fees, uh, giving them a competitive advantage. Economy, yeah, absolutely. You got the uh, economies of scale. Innovations and types of index funds are always easy to copy, meaning that's especially hard to, for small companies to disrupt the big ones. And more and more people, as more and more people put money into index funds, these guys argue the big companies will continue getting bigger and bigger. And unlike many other investors, Vanguard, BlackRock, and State Street reliably vote at shareholder meetings. I thought it was my wife driving by. Reliably, reliably vote at shareholder meetings, which makes them even more influential, influential when it comes to company decision making. I 100% agree with that. That bothers me significantly. If trends continue, they project these companies could cast over 40% of the votes in every single one of the 500 largest companies in America. In this giant three scenario, three investment managers, Gus Souter, who used to run Vanguard, would largely dominate shareholder voting and particularly all significant 
U.S. companies that do not have a controlling shareholder. They fear this would have drastic implications for corporate governance and competition. I, and I 100% agree with that. That is a concern I've got big time. Uh, there will be some legislation passed in which to make sure uh, that uh, these, these aren't monopolistic. That's becoming that way in the index fund area. I, I, I agree with that completely. And that's the concern I've got for sure. Unfortunately, my 100000 bucks, your 100000 bucks, and the guy over there, 100000 bucks, don't matter. It's all the big, the behemoth investors of the world that matter. Our stuff doesn't matter, so we can't hold a candle to these guys. Unfortunately, that's where the government's going to have to step in and say, no, nah, you can't control this stuff, Vanguard. You can't control this stuff, BlackRock. Well, hell, God forbid, freaking State Street Global Advisors, the biggest hypocrites there are. Uh, just, oh, I can't stand those guys. Another group of scholars argue that these gigantic institutional investors are already posing a threat to healthy marketplace, and they urge the federal government to adopt new rules that in, limit institutional investors from owning large stakes in multiple companies in the same industry. I, again, I completely, completely agree with that. Because that's politically driven, we've already seen Vanguard go the way of a green, uh, we gotta be green. You know, we got to get rid of fossil fuels. This isn't shareholder. This is stuff. This is, this is stuff that's made of rich people who want to get richer at the expense of, corp of competition. We want to limit barriers to entry of other people getting involved here. That's, that's not good. And unfortunately, the companies are going to go along with it because Vanguard and State Street and BlackRock will have the voting rights here. We look back at the housing bubble with an astonishment of how that could happen. <laughs> There goes my wife. Burry didn't see it coming. That more people like Burry didn't see it coming. It's possible that someday we'll look at the promise that everyone can just buy and hold pieces of an entire market and nothing will go wrong. All right, so I, I also want to say too about, we'll go back to the indexing. These are, the, the draw. The thing about indexing is not only can the vast majority of people not beat the market, and that's just a fact, you no know, fees. Uh, but don't forget, you're also buying companies that are growing. You're buying, this isn't just facades these are real companies that you frequent every day their employees working there their employees receiving paychecks there you're dropping credit cards there you're inv you're investing them in by buying your pair of shoes there by buying your groceries you know by getting an amazon delivery these are all companies that have a growing earnings base so the idea that that will never be priced accordingly well hell if freaking market makers and active investors were able to price these correctly, then the act, there'd be a whole lot more active managers that could consistently outperform. And we just don't see that. So I just, that's silly. But even if they could, it doesn't matter because at the end, of the, I mean, it won't happen, but even if they could, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, corporations exist to grow bottom line. And they do that by producing goods and services that are valuable, of value to a consuming public, regardless of if it's being owned by an index fund, if it's being owned by an active manager, the consuming public says, yeah, I want a piece of that. I'm going to go buy my hamburger there. And then investing public says, yeah, I want to invest in that because they are making money. If index funds and capitalism say, you know, we don't think company A is growing any more or better than company B, when other people see company B is growing better, well, no one's putting a gun to the head of company B and said, you got to buy now, no one's put a gun to the head and said to company, some of you got to buy company B at such and such price. There's always going to be an active guy out there who says he can outperform. And when he does consistently, he's going to draw money. That's how it works. Anyway, I don't worry about this stuff at all. I do worry about a company like Vanguard, BlackRock, and State Street and getting so big where they control the votes of the largest 500 companies in America. Can't have that. So hopefully Trump's will get in front of that. If I was the, uh, you know, the big uh, behemoths, corporations, and I don't like Trump because whatever, uh, Elizabeth Warren's going to be a lot worse, buds. So you better get on the Trump train because uh, you, 